you just clap your hands and give him great praise today, would you? Praise the name of the Lord. Jesus, we do praise you today, Lord. From our heart, from our soul, we give you praise and glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Are you glad to be in church today? You look amazing. Would you welcome all of our campuses that are joining us live right now? We're so thankful for each and every one of you. And all of you who are joining us online, thank you for being a part. Would you welcome two or three people to church this morning and tell them you're glad they're sitting around you as you find your seat? We received this morning a video from our missionaries in Haiti, Bobby and Sherry Burnett. We have worked with them and their ministry there for many, many years. And uh, with your help, we've been able to do a lot of work. And we have sent a check every month since 2011. Uh, every month we've sent a check to feed hungry people in Haiti and built some wonderful buildings there that are still being used even as we speak. If you haven't seen it on the news, 7.2 magnitude earthquake hit Haiti yesterday and there have been many hundreds of lives lost. And our missionary there sent this video this morning. So turn your eyes to the screen and listen to this and let it speak to your heart. Pastor Jensen, God bless you and everyone. We love you. Uh, you had asked us to do an update report on the earthquake that hit yesterday morning at 8.29 a.m. here in the country of Haiti. First of all, we are okay out here in Fond Parisien, and we're inside now the food, the Kingdom Connection Food Distribution Center that you have built and the Kingdom Connection partners and your friends here this beautiful, as long as a warehouse. Thank you so much. But this area is okay. Mm -hmm. We're okay and we're safe. Uh, the 7.2 magnitude earthquake hit the southern part of Haiti. It demolished houses, one whole hospital. It demolished, killed many, many people. Another big church demolished how they was baptized and people killed them. Uh, it demolished many buildings. And it killed many, many people. We don't know how many yet. There's been the worst food crisis in Haiti that we've ever seen since we moved here in 1991. And now, on top of this food crisis, the earthquake has hit. And I've seen in the news a while ago, now it looks like, unless I misread it, down in the Caribbean, another hurricane is on its way up. Probably will mm -hmm. come right over Haiti. But let me tell you just one thing. When the last earthquake hit, I remember a pastor said, we felt like everybody abandoned us, like none of the Christians cared. And so we cannot let these people mm. in Haiti feel that we have abandoned them, like nobody's coming to their help. We have to do something to help these people, to let them know that the Christian people are standing by them and that God is going to bring them through this. Yes. So thank you, whatever you can do, prayers, whatever, large or small, if God puts them in your heart, do it. And we pray that many, many, many people will, people come, to the will Lord. come to know Jesus as yes, a Savior. Yes, as they did in the last earthquake. And the, yes, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 40, when you have done it to one of the least of these little ones, my brethren, you have done it unto me. God bless you. Thank you. And I want to thank you for making that kind of ministry happen. And uh, we, will, we will monitor closely with them and find out where the greatest needs are and we'll do extra and beyond what we normally do because of your support. Thank you for helping us all around the world. We built homes there that were reinforced with rebar because they have so many earthquakes. And there's the, the subdivision. Uh, many of the, We took a whole section of those homes. We did one side, and Joyce Myers Ministry did the other side and built a bunch of those homes that those families live in. 
and you did that. You made that happen. That may not look like much to you, but over there, that is, that is a miracle provision of God, and they're so grateful, and they're so thankful, and they are the most precious, joyful people that I think I've ever met in the earth. I've traveled all over the world, and I, I just have a special love in my heart for the Haitian people. Every time I go there, I'm moved at the joy. They have so little and they have so much joy in their hearts. And that's especially and only those that know Christ. And uh, we thank God for his help and for you being a miracle for that nation. Help us pray. How many of you will pray for Haiti this week and the precious people that God will help them and lead them and guide them? Are you ready for the word today? Open your Bibles with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36. In verse 2, he said, take a scroll and a book and write. Write it, all the words that I have spoke unto you against Israel. And then in verse 16, or, or let's go down to verse 22 for the sake of time. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with fire burning in the heart before him. And it happened when Jehudai had read three or four columns or chapters that the king cut it out with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire. I want to talk to you today on this subject. This is not your final chapter. This is not your final chapter. God is still writing your story. The story is still being written. All is not done. Many people become perusers of history instead of making history. Many people begin to live in what God used to do in their life and what he used to do in the Bible, and they fail to understand he's still writing. He is writing the next chapter of your life. I don't know what kind of chapter you're in, but God says, don't put a period where I put a comma. I want you to trust me that this is not the final chapter, that what I have ahead of you is greater than what is behind you. There's this group of people that I'm going to talk about today in the Bible called scribes. You read of them constantly in the Old and New Testament. Ezra, for example, one of the books of the Bible is Ezra, and Ezra was a scribe. The scribe had a specific job of grabbing the pen and a scroll or a piece of paper and writing down what the king said or what the prophet said and recording it and making it a permanent record. Many times scribes would be allowed to go where no one else could go, like into the throne room. And they would record every word that the king would say in his conversations with people who would come and meet with him. And then they would chronicle those words and keep them in a special place. The scribe had a specific role to record history. And when you read in the Bible over and over, you'll read of how kings, certain kings, for example, in the Old Testament, the Bible said in the days of Esther that the king couldn't sleep one night. And he called for the scribes to bring the books, the record books, and read to him just randomly what had been discussed in previous conversations in the throne room. Apparently, it was boring to here, because when the king wanted to go to sleep, he would have them read these day-to-day -day activities. And you better not pull that on me while I'm preaching or I'll embarrass you. I can see you at the other campuses. And, and, but, but can you imagine, and there's this story, this amazing story of the king in Esther's day, and he couldn't sleep. And so he called for the scribe to read some of the old records and it just so happened that where they opened the book, there was the story of a man by the name of Mordecai. And the king's kind of sleepy, and he starts listening. And, the, and, the, and there was a little footnote that 
On this day, Mordecai heard of an assassination attempt on the king, and he reported it to the palace guards. And the king woke up and came out of his stupor, and he said, what? This man saved my life, saved my kingdom. I was not assassinated because of this man named Mordecai. Has he ever been rewarded? And they said, sir, we're searching the records, and no one ever rewarded him. And you know, I don't have time to tell that whole story, but he got his reward because someone wrote it down. Here's a good thing to remember. The scribe was someone who reminded the king of his obligations. He had the ability to remind the king of what had happened and what had been done for his kingdom. Take good notes when the king talks. To you personally, write down things when God speaks to your heart. When you read the Bible, when you hear sermons, you shouldn't just assume that if God really speaks to you, have you ever had a sermon or a preacher preach and it's like they were eavesdropping in on your house all week long, that they were listening secretly to you in your bedchamber or in your living room as something happened in your life? When God speaks to you that specifically, one of the most powerful things you should do is when the king talks, take good notes. Write down what the king said and remind yourself constantly of it. So powerful were scribes, just people with pens who wrote what the king said. That in 2 Kings 25, when Nebuchadnezzar invaded Israel, he commanded that his troops go and arrest and slaughter for the most part, not only the the, the, the king of Israel and the royal family or the people that were in charge and, the, and those in the army that they had to fight, the army of Israel, the captains and the leaders. But he said, and the principal scribe. All this guy did was took an ink horn and, some, and a pen and he would write. And he, according to Nebuchadnezzar, needed to be on the hit list because he could do major damage to our attempt to take over Israel, if he started pulling those records out and reading the old stories to Israel of how they had faced times like this before, enemies powerful like this before, but somehow, some way, God brought them the victory and he can do it again. And Nebuchadnezzar knew anybody who has a pen and records what God has told them and then be begins to confess it and speak it, they are dangerous to my kingdom. It pays to take good notes. If God has ever done it in the past, he can do it again. If he's ever healed cancer, he can do it again. If he's ever delivered someone from drug addiction, he can do it again. If he's ever healed a broken life, he can do it again. It pays to take good notes and remind yourself of God's promises in your life and what he spoke. And in Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah was told by God, don't just remind yourself of how God brought people out of Egypt, but remind, I want you to not just read the story of how he brought Moses and the people of God out of Egypt. But he said, I want you to take a pen and I want you to start writing your own story. See, it was a story to you, but it was a miracle to them. And I want you to take a pen in your hand, Jeremiah, because you, you and the people in your generation are going to go into Babylonian captivity, but I'm not going to leave you there. That's not the final chapter. Write down that you're coming out after 70 years. And he, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, began to write it down. Don't just recite what he's done, but write that he will do it again. I'm going to let you write your own story. Don't just be happy with what God has done in your past because he's just getting started. 
When I think about this ministry, I think about all that God has done. It's so easy for us to talk about the past, but I want a pen in my hand. I want to believe that Jesus is just as powerful in the midst of a pandemic and troubling times. I believe the greatest chapter of the history of this church is yet to be written. We're about to see revival on a level we have never seen it before in America and the world. And I don't care if you believe it because it's written, but it's not enough to have head knowledge. It's not enough to know God healed the leper and God did this and God did signs and wonders and miracles and saves the lost. But you have to not only have to be able to recite the old stories, but what happens is when it becomes more than letter. The Bible said the letter kills, but the spirit makes alive. And there has to come a point where you push away from reading just the stories and you begin to get a fresh page and an ink pen and you start writing, believing what God said he's saying again. When I'm fighting hell, I don't need an old story. I need a pen. I need to change the period to a comma. So many churches are reading more about their history than they're writing about their future. It's, it's too, many, too many Christians are reciting their history instead of making history. Focused more on where they've been than where God is trying to take them. In the New Testament, scribes were not very popular with Jesus. I cannot find one time where he wanted to eat with them. He didn't like to hang around, around them. He even said, woe be unto you Pharisees and woe. Anytime God puts a woe on you, that is not good. And Jesus said, woe unto you historians who think I'm the God of yesterday, who all you do is you can quote every verse, but you don't believe it. You don't believe he can heal now. You don't believe he can deliver now. You don't believe that he can turn your situation around. You've just sat in church and you've heard a lot of reading of old stories, but it doesn't do you any good until you take a pen and you say, I believe and I'm hearing the king speaking today. If God did it for me, he can do it for you. I, I've been blessed and fortunate to have some influence over young preachers all across the nation. And many of them call me and, and send me nice texts and stuff all week long about a message or something that touched their life. And I'm humbled by that. And they, they come sometimes and just visit and they want to see these facilities and they want to see all that God has done. But, and, I want, and I want to say to them sometimes, it's thank you and we're honored in all of that, but don't just read my story. Get your pen out because the same God God can do it. If he could take two or 300 people in Gainesville and raise up a church like he has raised up and we get to preach to 200 nations of the world every day of the week through television, my God. Oh, come on and clap your hands. That was pitiful. Don't just, don't just hear somebody else's story, get you a pen and say, I got a clear page, Lord, and I'm, I'm ready for a new thing today. Some of you are living in yesterday and living in the glory days and talking about how it used to be and how God used to use you. You need to get a pen. God told Israel, he said that in, in the book of Judges that there would come a group that, that there would come a group that would be known as Zebulun. It was one of the 12 tribes. And God said, because they fought, and this is in Judges chapter four, because they fought with Deborah. You remember Deborah? She was a mighty warrior, not, not, not a man, a woman. And Deborah led Israel's army into battle. She was an amazing girl. And she led them to victory. And the Bible said fighting with them was a tribe called Zebulun. And because they demonstrated such courage and fearlessness against all odds, God took note of it and prophesied over this tribe called Zebulun. And he said that they would be, and put it up, there it is. He said, out of Zebulun 
will come a group of people who will handle the pen of the writer. You read right over that and think that has no significance unless you look up Zebulun. It was a tribe that lived, and to this day, Zebulun is Galilee, which is the northern part of Israel, which is the area of Capernaum where Jesus performed most of the miracles of his ministry. That text is saying there's going to come a day when Jesus is going to show up in Galilee and, and, he's, and they're going to need pens, not just to tell old stories about Moses and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Daniel and the lion's den, but when this guy shows up, there's going to need to be a bunch of people with pens that know how to write that he's not just the God of I used to be, but he is the great I am. And the majority of Jesus' miracles were done in that region where they had so many pens and people who were gifted in writing. But the problem was the scribes wanted to hold on to the old way and they constantly followed Jesus around. It, I mean, it should have been a scribe heyday. Jesus is opening blind eyes, healing lepers, raising dead people. They should have been writing like fire, should have been smoke coming off the page. But instead, all they do is follow him around and say, did you just heal her on the Sabbath? The old history book said you can't do nothing on the Sabbath and you just healed that woman. My God, that you just broke the law. They didn't understand. You got the pen, the guy who wrote the law, the one, the fire, fing, the finger of fire that was on the mountain that wrote the Ten Commandments. Here it is, and he's laying that hand on people and people are being healed. But they couldn't receive it because they had an old religious spirit like many people in the church have today. They just sit back and read the stories, but it's not for our day, and we really don't need to believe, and God can't do anything in the middle of a pandemic, and we're not really going to see revival, and healing isn't real, and miracles aren't real, and God can't touch this generation. They're too far gone. No, I don't believe that. And I'm pulling out the pen today, and I'm saying God's going to write another chapter over America and the world. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult, but we need to be people of faith who say there's another chapter coming, and it's a chapter that I believe is going to be the best. He saved the best for last. Everybody take a five-second praise break, and I'll, I'll keep moving. <laughs> so guess what? Guess what, where all the writers were in Galilee? Guess what happened? This tall, lean Galilean named Jesus, after he fasted 40 days, that's how I know he was lean. <laughs> after he fasted 40 days, he showed up out of the wilderness, walked into the temple. He was a rabbi, so he had the right to get up and lead the service. And he opened the book, the Bible said. And they had read that old sleepy verse out of Isaiah so many times, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. To, uh, he, I'll, he, I'll heal the brokenhearted. He shall open the eyes of the blind. Ooh. And, 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 and people snored. Jesus walked in the author and opened the book. Now y'all follow me with the verses because I, I want to I I see it in the, put it up on the walls what I'm saying, the, the verse. The verse I want. Don't worry about it. Just put it. No, the one that you had in the first service. Come on. There you go. And then after he read it, after he read it, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has on they, the Bible said, and every eye was fastened on him. No sleepy people. No people who weren't expecting it. Every eye was fastened on him and he closed the book. And he said these powerful words, this day is this fulfilled. This day. And then he said, he, what he was saying was, that was good. That's the old covenant. That's the old Testament. But this day is a new day. This day, I'm going to heal some people. This day, I, I'm here to declare that this day, you can be healed. This day, you can be filled. 
This day, you can get free from alcoholism. This day, you can have your marriage restored, your family healed. I believe in the God of right now, not the great I used to be or I'm going to be. The I am is in the house. The pen is in the room. He showed up, and when he finished, he said, this day is fulfilled. Don't just recite it. Now give me a blank page is what Jesus was saying, because I'm the pen. In the beginning was the Word. I'm the Word, and I'm the Word made flesh, and I can write anything I want. I'm God, so give me the pen, and I need some people to get a pen and start writing down the new things and the new stuff chapters of history, his story, that I want to write. And it's interesting because when he wants to write another chapter, there's always resistance. Whenever the pen is in the house and in John chapter 8, he leaves there and within a few chapters in John chapter 8, The Bible said the scribes and the Pharisees, there they are. Who are they? People who, they they can quote you the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And thank God for that verse. I believe in the Ten Commandments. They've never been done away with. Jesus, let me put it like, Jesus said, I did not come, I did not come to cause the law to go away, I came to fulfill it. I'm the law giver, and then when I show up, I'm the law liver. Through my death and resurrection, you can live what is recorded. And they said, they, the scribes and the Pharisees took this woman, taken from the act of adultery, shoved her onto the ground, And they came holding Moses' law and said, Moses and the law said, stone her. And they would have been all right if they had just stayed right there. But then they ask a stupid question to ask Jesus. What do you say? And I can't prove it, but I think Jesus had been waiting for this moment for thousands of years. I think he had been, I think he, when he heard them say, what do you say? The law says that she's got to die. The law says she doesn't have a future. The law says that she's over. The law says that she's messed up so bad she's ruined. The law says drag her in and stone her to death. What do you say? And Jesus in that moment said, I've been waiting for this. He dropped down on his knees and pulled out the pen. And he took his finger, your Bible said, and he started writing in the sand. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone and they all, the Bible said from the oldest to the youngest because the older ones had a longer list of sins, the oldest from the youngest dropped the rock and walked off and Jesus then said neither do I condemn you go and sin no more in other words, dear lady sin wrote you into this mess but grace is writing you out of this mess forgiveness is writing you out of this mess Calvary is writing you out of this mess. How many of you are glad that God wrote you out of your mess? You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You were headed for ruin. But he wrote you out of your mess. And here you are in God's house this morning. Somebody give him a mighty praise. He knows how to write you out of your mess. He knows how to write you out of the book of death into the book of life. He knows how to get your name in the Lamb's book of life. There's an interesting story that we just read in pieces of in Jeremiah 36. 
because here's what was taking place. I didn't have time to read it, but you should go read that whole chapter if you, if you really want to understand this message. Because in Jeremiah 36, God gave Jeremiah a word from the Lord for the temple and for the king, for the church and for the king. And the Bible said that Jeremiah had been banned from going to the temple because he wouldn't preach any good sermons. Every time he got up and preached, they wanted to hear something that would tickle their little ears and, and bless them and tell them how, and every time he got up, he'd just, he'd just let it rip. And they banned him, the preacher, from the temple and brought them in some little guys who would come in and just tell them what they wanted to hear. And the Bible said, Jeremiah, and I, I think I'll just read it because it's too good just to skip over, just because you want to beat the Baptist to the buffet. I, I, I want to I wanna read what I want to read. <laughs> Take a scroll, Jer Jeremiah, verse 2, and write all the words that I have spoken to you. And he called in a scribe. This is in verse 16. And when, he had, and when he had heard, and, 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 and the scribe wrote down, and then he said, now they banned me from the temple. I don't have time to go into all of it. But he said, Jeremiah said, they banned me, but write down everything I tell you to the scribe. And, the, and he said, and go to the outskirts of the gate of the temple and stand there and scream to the top of your voice the words that I've given you. They won't let us in, so we're going to preach out on the street. And they did it. He did it. The scribe did it. And when he did, the people inside got more interested in what he was saying than that old boring preacher up there sitting on a stool drinking a diet Snapple. Amen. He, 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 want, he, he had a word from the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He had a word from the Lord. And the Bible said, even the false priest said, oh my God, that's a word from the Lord. We've got to go tell the king. This is where the story gets interesting. And the Bible said that the king was at his winter palace, sitting by the fire. And they came in and they read him the words of the prophet. And some of the words were good, that if you would do this, and if you'll be willing and obedient, God will do this, and God will bless you, and God will fight for you, and God will, God will provide. But some of the words were really, really strong. If you don't obey the Lord, you're God. And, and, and so here's what the king did. Your Bible, you just read it. He took something called a pen knife, and he starts cutting out the parts of the message he doesn't like and throws them into the fire. And he says, now I really like this part, leave it. But I don't like that part, cut it out. And throw it into the fire. I like that part about mercy and grace and forgiveness. I don't like that part about forgive your enemies. And I don't like that part about living holy. And I don't like, cut that out. Cut that out. Cut that out. He started cutting out parts, grabbing his pen knife and cutting out the parts that he didn't like. And I'm telling you, I believe that some people, all they want is a ticket to heaven. And they've decided they're just going to cut out parts of the book that they don't want to live that encroach upon their life. But that's not the true gospel. There's more to the gospel than a ticket to heaven. We want to cut out Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Wait a minute. I, that's too early. Thou shalt not lie. I, I'm, no, you ain't coming in right now. No way. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I'm just getting to the good. See, you can't cut this part short. You get thrown in the fire. I'm, I'll get there, but I'm going to get there. I don't like that part. We don't need that anymore. I don't believe in that anymore. I don't think that's necessary anymore. And here we are, and we're sitting on our little thrones, 
and we're cutting pieces of the word out and throwing it into the fire, trying to control the message. It's not your message, it's God's message. And he still says, if you're going to make it to heaven, you're going to have to be holy like I am holy. If you're going to make it to heaven, you're going to have to... You, there, there are pastors and preachers that are... And y'all know I'm not a judgmental, mean guy. I don't beat up on my fellow preachers and stuff. But it's disturbing to me that you never hear pastors... They're, they're cutting out Jeremiah 1, that before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. And, and, and before you were conceived, I called you and had a plan for you. And they never talk about abortion. They just cut that part out. And, and, and God loves people who've had an abortion. God understands and he loves you. But I I want you to know is still the taking of an innocent life. We can't cut that out. We can't cut out marriage between a man and a woman is the only kind of marriage that we can't to be. Well, I, I'm a woke pastor. You've been, you've been drinking too much woke cola Amen. You, 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 you're believing this stuff. No, it's still a God of separation. It's still come out from among them. It's still live holy. It's still fast and pray. It still resists temptation. I can look at whatever I want. I'm cutting that part out and throwing it in the fire. I can go wherever I want. I can shake it in the club on Saturday night and praise him on the pew on Sunday morning. I'm cutting that part out. I don't like that. Listen, this is not a game, folks. You know what else? Those same people are cutting the rapture out. You don't hear anybody preaching on the second coming. They're cutting the Antichrist in 666. But if it's in the book, you better not cut it out and throw it into the fire. Something's going on. This is a trial run. When you can't buy food unless you meet the standard of something's going on. And we better quit cutting the message up and throwing it in the fire. We don't need that today. That's not politically correct. That's not nice. That might cause somebody to really get stirred up. And brother, brother Big Bucks may leave the church if pastor mentions that. So let's just proclaim, Jesus is coming again. The trumpet is going to sound. People are going to be left behind. Let's not cut out. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And you're going to spend eternity in one of them. I don't care how nice you are. I don't care how much money you have. Do you know Jesus? You must be born again of the spirit and of water. Let's not cut out. Marriage is sacred. Till death do we part. What God, that's a verse. That's not just a wedding thing. That's a verse. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Here's one we want to cut out. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Turn to somebody and say, I'm glad you didn't cut that out. I see you in God's house on Sunday. But there's a whole generation coming up, and they're cutting it up and throwing it in the fire, cutting it up, throwing it into the fire, and only what's left is, the Lord bless me. And I'm all for the blessing. Y'all know me. Sit down. You ain't going to speed my sermon up. I'm almost done. But, but something's got to give. We got to have revival. I mean, is, is, is it not getting through yet? Have we not had enough of two years of living hell and, and quarantined and everything else? And it's been awful and deaths and it's real. The pandemic is real. And is God trying to say something to us? that maybe you need to stop cutting out the important stuff like the coming of the Lord and standing before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of everything that you have done? Is anybody feel an alarm going off in your soul that these are not normal times? That surely the church ought to get on her knees and get serious and worship ought to be like some kind of 
fire igniter. It shouldn't even take a cord. We ought to be, oh God, we need you in times like these. So let me close my little sermon. This is it. Now you can start playing. Don't you love those guys? They're the best in the world. I give them a hard time, but they know I love them. Now listen to this. How do you write your next chapter? Because I felt like calling this sermon, Write Your Next Chapter. Because we, we want God to do everything. But Psalms 45 and 1 gives the secret. It says this. My heart is full of good things. I speak things which I have made from touching the king. Watch. My tongue is the pen. Everybody say, my tongue is the pen. Say it again. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. My tongue is the pen that writes the next chapter. Change what you're saying. If he could do it then, he can do it now. If he could provide and heal and do miracles and signs and wonders, I'm not cutting that out of the book. I'm, I'm proclaiming. And that's why praise is so powerful. That's why songs like we've been singing this morning are so powerful because your pen is writing those into your next chapter. Prayer is your pen. The pen of a, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Prayer is that pen. Praise is that pen. Confession is that pen. Declaring God's word. And I close with this, the final closing. In the book of Revelation, it said in the 12th chapter that we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Derek Prince, a man who's a great preacher who's gone on to be with the Lord, put it like this. The greatest definition in Revelation I've ever heard on that is this. We overcome when we make our confession what the Word says the blood does. When we begin to say with our mouth what the Word says, the New Testament blood does. We begin to overcome. And my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved and thy house. Hallelujah. You know what I just did? I wrote the next chapter. Regardless of what you're seeing now, write the next chapter. Lord, I praise you that you're my healer. Someone may be in the intensive care unit that you love very much, may be in critical condition, but you can sit here today and God's looking for a people that'll take the pen of faith and say, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. And God, I heard this sermon for a reason and I claim your healing power today like you cleanse lepers and like you raise the dead. You can do it today, God. How many of you believe that? Would you stand to your feet and would you lift up both hands in the air if you feel comfortable doing it? And would you open your mouth and would you for the next 15 seconds begin to praise God audibly, out loud for something that you're facing that the enemy said, just settle for it. Just settle for it. Just settle for less than what God promised you. Look at me one moment. Now, I, I hear the Lord right now in my soul. How many of you, God has promised you something and the enemies wanted you to cut it out and whittle it down? And well, maybe God really didn't say it. Throw it into the fire. 
well, it may happen, but he really meant it would happen this way. And you keep cutting it down till only what's left is what a human strength can produce. I challenge you today. I'm glad I didn't do that with this ministry because I knew what God told me he was gonna do and I know what he's telling me he's going to do. It ain't over. We're about to write our greatest chapter. But here's the deal. You have to be tena tenacious with your faith and pull the pen of your tongue and say what God's word says the blood does. Raise those hands. Open your mouth and begin to bless your family and bless your home and bless your life and claim healing and claim health and claim miracles and claim the power of God. Claim it all over this room. Claim it, claim it, claim it. You've been silent. You've been living in the past. Some of you haven't had a fresh move of God in so long, in so long. I want to ask you something. Who am I preaching to this morning that the enemy's told you to take the promise of God and just throw it in the fire? Your family will never turn around. Your marriage will never turn around. Your life will never turn around. That addiction will never be loose from your life. You, are just, you just need to throw that promise in the fire. Cut it out. I'm not going to be a cutting edge preacher. I'm going to believe for miracles, signs, and wonders in this church. And if you know that God's spoken to you and the enemy's told you to cut that promise out and throw it in the fire, get out of your seat and come stand. There is a supernatural anointing here this morning. Come and stand. If you're lost, come. If you've got an addiction, come. If you're bound, come. If you're defeated and depressed, come. If you're going through something that is so severe you need supernatural help, come. Come now. Come in faith. Come and get, grab your pen and grab a fresh piece of paper and say there's another chapter that's going to be written. I'm not going out like this. It can't end like this. This is not the end. God has a new chapter he's writing in your story. Declare it. Here. Now I preach. It's up to you to open your mouth. You've got the pen. Your tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Speak it. Declare it. Open your mouth and ask the big ass. Boldly ask God to do it. Boldly in Jesus' name approach the throne and make the big ask. Ask him big. Ask him for something that you can't do. Church, raise your hands and declare it. Now, now you're either a scribe sitting there living in story land are you going to pull up to the table and grab a pen this morning and write revival in your own life, in your own soul? Open your mouth and repent and say, Jesus, wash me. Jesus, cleanse me. Jesus, I confess with the pen of my mouth, you is my Lord and Savior. He'll save you. He'll deliver you. He'll fill you. He'll renew you.
I will never settle for it again. I'm going to stir the fire until it's blazing. Glory, glory, chains fall. Write it, write it with your tongue. Declare it with your mouth. Jesus, the pen is in the house. Jesus is in the house.
ocean pound. Nothing is too hard for the working hand of God. So come release your heat. I know you are willing. Nothing is too hard for the Could we raise our hands and believe for healing? If you know somebody who needs healing, speak their name. Use your tongue. Use your tongue as a pen. Lord, those that are in the hospitals with COVID, those that are in Haiti suffering, those all over the world that need miracles. Come on, you take our sickness, we say. Oh, you take our sickness and remove our disease. You take our weakness. Give us strength. study all the time, but I try for my personal devotion to read through the Bible. I'm doing a one-year Bible, and I have done that for many years. And when I take, I always get a new Bible and do it, and I'll write things specifically on the side that as I'm reading it, the Holy Spirit speaks to me personally. And when I say speak, I don't hear an audible voice. It's just, wow, I needed that. And I'll put any impression down that I have or circumstance that I'm in that I needed that. To remind myself of God's promise. And at the end of the year, I usually take that Bible and I give it to somebody. And then I'll start another one every year. And I've done that for every one of my children. I've given them a Bible. Now I'm doing it for my grandchildren. And it's so important when the king speaks to write it down. Hebrew, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2. I want to close with this. And the Lord answered me and said, what? Write the vision and make it plain. Write the vision. Write what God's said. Write down sermons 
that He speaks specifically to you. So you don't know what you're going to face next week, but if you've got a word, you've got a sword. And your pen is your weapon. That little red thing right there called the tongue, that's your pen. And your pen is your weapon. The battle's real. This isn't playtime. You're either going to get in and get sold out, or you're going you're gonna, to you're be one of those that fall by the wayside because you're cutting and pasting the Word of God. I want to get back to where I want to be more like Him instead of Him being more like me because I don't like me without Him. Use your tongue right now and say this prayer. Lord Jesus, I have the tongue, which is a pen of the ready writer. So I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Therefore, the word declares, because of the blood of Jesus, my name is being written in the Lamb's book of life. I believe in you. I believe you carried my sin to the cross, past, present, and future. And I believe you rose from the dead and you give me power to walk in victory. I believe in you, Jesus. Write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name, I am saved. Clap your hands and praise him. If you prayed that prayer, I want to tell you one more thing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm tired of apologizing too. But God's really dealt with me about a prayer meeting. And I'm going to give you a couple weeks. But we're going to start on Sunday night an old-fashioned prayer meeting. The praise team is going to sing. We're going to come in here with no agenda. I'm going to walk in with no sermon prepared. Unless God tells me to, I don't, I'm not going to preach. We're going to spend about an hour in praise and worship and prayer. And here's the important thing, and flow and prophesy and lay hands and anoint with oil and, and let people receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. We're not cutting that part out and throwing it in the fire. We're going to see a whole bunch of young people get radically set on fire for God in Sunday night prayer meeting. We're going to bring back the old-fashioned wheat between the porch and the altar. I don't need a bunch. I wish all of you. Wouldn't it be something if two or three thousand people started showing up not to hear a pastor or preacher showing up for Jesus. I just want to be in his presence. He's life to me. But there will be no agenda. No tenseness, no program. They'll just start singing. We don't know what God's going to do. We're just going to walk in here wide open with an empty page and a pen and say, Holy Spirit, whatever you want to do, we're ready to go there. And devil, if you don't like it, come get some. <laughs> That's how I feel about him. I hate him right now. You, you, you pick to fight, then come get some because greater is he that is in us. No weapon form. The chapter's already being written. You believe it? I believe it. Raise your hand and receive the blessing. Listen, I want to say something else. <laughs> Don't ever feel bad about wearing a mask to this church. We want people to come and feel comfortable however they want to do it. I don't, I don't, I, man, that's a personal thing. Let everybody be what they want to be and let's quit all this stupid stuff. 
get the shot, if you want to get the shot, if you don't want to get the shot. I, I wish everybody would do what they feel like they're supposed to do. I'm praying what God would have me do and what he would have you do. How about you? Everything is something to pray about. And, if you, and, 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 and just be safe. Just be safe. Keep washing your hands a lot. Take zinc, take vitamin C, take D12. I'm taking it all. I'm taking so many. There's nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. If somebody wants to wear a mask, then wear a mask. Absolutely wear a mask. And if you, you know, if, if you're not sure, you better, you better put, if, if your faith is not sure, you better put a mask on. <laughs> But I'm not, I'm not getting into none of that. I'm just wanting to make a general statement that we love people coming. We don't care how they come. You come in a space suit if you want to. I don't care. I just want, we got to keep getting in church together. I know that. And we got to keep doing this and believing God's going to break through, right? You understand what I'm saying? Let's pray for our doctors and nurses. Let's pray for our people and taking care of sick people. Wonderful, wonderful people. God, we pray for the sick, the afflicted. We have used our tongue to sing it and to proclaim it. You're the God of healing. Never has that song been more important than it is right now. We declare life over every person fighting for their life. In Jesus' mighty name, touch our doctors, nurses, first responders, wonderful people working in cafeterias and schools and all kinds of uh, cleaning and cleaning the rooms and those that are that go in with, with, with the elderly and the sick, Lord. We just pray, oh God, for them. Keep them and bless them with a supernatural covering, we pray. And we thank you for it. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine on you. Be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Do you receive that blessing? Say amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, church. Walk in the spirit. I'm going to announce that prayer meeting in about two weeks. They're reminding me to encourage you to be a giver in the give online. They're giving stations out in the lobbies. Help us. We're going to do some extra stuff. We'll send thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to Haiti to help them. We know the need is going to be great. We need extra, so help us. You're going to help us, and we appreciate it. Worship God. If you've ever been a tither, you ought to be a tither in times like these. When you tithe, you're saying, God, you are my source. That's what you're saying. God, you are my source. Tomorrow night is the opening of School of Discipleship. And there's a tent out back if you want to grow in the Word, if you want to learn about Ezra and the history of each book of the Bible, if you want to get deeper into God's Word and into prayer and involved in the church, all of our leaders, all of them come out of School of Discipleship. Go through that extremely powerful training and you can start tomorrow night. It begins the whole new semester and you talk about something that will change your life forever, forever. It will be happening tomorrow night. Go by the tent outside and get signed up today. It's going to be a powerful, powerful time. We love you. Be blessed. Walk in the Spirit. Free Chapel online family, what an absolutely amazing and powerful word that pastor just gave us today. Listen, it is not your final chapter. There's still a story to be written. God is not done with you yet. So encouraging and just really brought like hope today. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I know it's brought hope for me and my family. I've got some facing COVID in the hospital and in intensive care unit. So we're just believing in full faith that he's gonna heal my papa today. Yes, yes, and he can do it, and he can do yes, it for you. Absolutely. He's done it before, he'll do it again. Yes. And I love, love, love that word that Pastor gave us. Listen, if you were watching today and you said yes to Jesus for the first time, 
we want to celebrate with you. We want to tell you how grateful, how proud we are of you. What a bold step of faith that you took today. Listen, if that was you, please text the word yes to the number 510 yeah. 510. Also, if you're watching and you just are looking for someone to pray with you, to believe in faith for something to take place in your life, you can text the word prayer to the number 510 510. And we've got a team who's trained, prayed up, prepared, and ready to call down heaven on your behalf, believing that God is going to move and do what only He can do in your situation. Amen. Hey, our school of discipleship classes are starting today. All over our campuses. So um, we want you to be able to do that too. You can go online to freechapel.org and you can sign up to take School of Discipleship. Hamilton and I walked through it and it's life changing. Yes. Also, we've got small groups we want you to be a part of. So go online, check those out, be in community with people. Yes, and also thank you so much, those of you online who've been so consistent in your giving. You've just not stopped. God is using yeah. you. God is really just using your resources yes. um, to do significant things in this community, um, locally, but also globally. Pastor talked about Haiti and the devastation that's taken place yeah. there just this past weekend. And, and you know, it's gonna be your resources that yes. allows us, affords us the opportunity and the ability to go and meet people's needs all the way across the world. So thank you so much for staying consistent. Yeah. If you're watching with us, you know, and I hope that you were touched by today's message and sermon and next Sunday, invite somebody, yes. whether that's a share on Facebook or, or it's you calling up your best friend and saying, hey, let's have a cup of coffee and just sit in front yes. of my TV and let's just, let's just worship God together. Yes. Yes. So invite somebody next Sunday. Yes, and that's what, that just made me think, the word that pastor gave today, that wasn't only for you and your situation. You mm. know someone who needs to hear that word. You know someone who needs to hear today, hey, yeah. your story's not over. The chapter's not done. He's got, he's still writing it. He's still yeah. got a plan, a purpose. So please, please, please share, encourage someone to listen to what God spoke through pastor today because it was powerful, it was significant. Well, listen, we're getting ready to hop off, but we're gonna pray together and believe God for an amazing week. Let's pray. God, we love you. We praise you today. Yes. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth and the power that's yes. represented in your word, God, we thank you that your word says that when it's spoken, it will not yes, return Jesus. void, God. So right now, we believe, we know that your presence, your Holy Spirit yeah. can move and do significant things no matter where we are. So yes, every Jesus. individual still tuning in, watching today, God, we speak Jesus, power, we Father. speak wholeness, yes, we speak Jesus. health, yes. we speak redemption, God. Yes. We speak complete yes. restoration in Jesus', Jesus. mighty name. Meet the needs of your people. God, hear their cry. Yes. God, we love you. We thank you again for the word that was spoken today, for what you've already done and what we know and can have faith that you will continue to do again. And again, we love you, Jesus. We praise you for it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, we love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday.